You ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready when on it. You ready to go? We are ready to go. We are ready to go. Boom. <laughs> All right. Well, we've, perhaps, we've, perhaps not. <laughs> yes. Okay. So okay. um, let's 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 start talking stuff. Okay. Well, welcome back, everybody. Thank you for taking part today. Um, Monday. It's Monday. It is Monday. We are yes. we 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 are still aware of which day it is, which is good at the moment. Hope you had a a good weekend. Um, I'm hoping that you managed to do something different to every other day right now. Now we've been doing some webinars. We've enjoyed doing these, and we want to do more of them. Um, and father here come up with the idea of I think of bonding as a subject, and I was like, Ooh, okay, um, yeah. yeah, this is you know I see questions about ethical bonding a lot of the time, um, even when I go to like the Lex exhibition. So some you know some people still have a, a misunderstanding with what the difference is between them, you know, uh, from a BS seven six seven one perspective. But you've kind of started creating material and you've kind of gone to town with it <laughs> fair to say yes yes it sort of got bigger and bigger and bigger okay. as i say um so this is why we might end up because these these honestly by the time you've listened to me for 45 minutes you mm. will be needing a stiff drink at least um, yeah, so we'll evaluate nice progress walk. we'll evaluate progress when we get to a um a slide number and then we'll decide you know what time yeah. is yeah we might get to um, a certain point and say right that's it and then we'll do a part two another day we'll see where we're at yeah. but i'm gonna i'm gonna be a passenger Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> sit here and I'm gonna just go. Um, I can offer some input. I've not actually seen all the slides, so this is really a an ask of college <laughs> thing. Oh. Sparking into drinking tea, watching. Right. Okay. In other words, you're taking no <laughs> no responsibility for this, just in case it crashes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm, 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 I'm here. I'm here with the buttons. Right. Go, okay. Go, go for it. Pop in line with I'm the in. thing and bonding. Okay. Right. Good morning, guys. Um, yeah. Earthing and bonding, we came up with this subject because it is such a huge issue and a huge um, part of the electrical system, and there's so many questions. So earthing and bonding, um, the main thing, or the, the thing that started me off on this was the fact that a lot of people get earthing and bonding confused, or they think it's the same thing. So what is earthing? What is bonding? Are they the same thing? They both use green and yellow cables. They connect to the main earth terminal, so an awful lot of the time it looks the same. Uh, and people do get to this you know situation where they think, oh, it's all one, but it's not. It's chalk and cheese, um, earthing bonding. If we go back to basic principles, and just forgive me for this, but I'll just sort of going back to basic principles. Uh, the general mass of the Earth is taken to be a potential of zero volt. So no matter where you are, um, the ground is zero volts in the United States. They call it ground. We call it Earth. Um, it's the one constant which is common to pretty much all electrical systems all over the world. Um, so if you are connected to ground up in Edinburgh and you're connected to ground down in London, you're into the same potential. So it provides a reference. Often referred to as true earth, if all the systems are connected to earth, they will have the same starting point. And that's important because when we talk about voltage, we're talking about potential differences. So consider if you're measuring somebody's height, okay, we can use a rule to measure somebody's height, but you've got two people there. One of them is obviously shorter than the other one, but they actually look taller because they're starting at a different point. So we need to have the same starting point. And it's the same with electrical systems, okay? When we measure voltages in electrical systems between conductors, we need to have a point of reference. That way we can say, yes, this is what the voltage is, because uh, we've got a reference point which is the same no matter where we are. If we earth the star point, as we know, of the secondary on the supply transformer or generator, yeah, it maintains the, that point at zero volts and stabilizes all the outgoing voltages. Now we've got a situation where the neutral is also connected to the star point, so that is maintained at zero volts as well. And it will remain at that as long as it's connected. If you disconnect the neutral, as we know from our 
experience when you go to a, a board and you disconnect a neutral which somebody shared for another circuit you'll actually get a whack off of it because it's now at 230 volts because you've removed it from that connection okay but, but normally a neutral will be at zero volts because it is connected to earth we now have a situation where we have 230 volts between earth and line and 230 volts between neutral and line and 400 volts between all the lines and we're stable at that point as long as that earth connection is maintained on the transformer if we lose that earth connection then all sorts of nonsense can, can occur it's it's pretty worth mentioning that time where we did have that experience can you remember uh, yeah i've got i've got the actual values here um mm. we we are working on a building where hang on yeah crack on yeah yeah uh we're working on a building where um there was building work going on and somebody in a JCB decided to uh, dig out the main electrode of the transformer. Uh, they thought well, their Christmases had come at once because they had a big pile of copper on the side of the trench, a big smile on their face. And we got a phone call saying, can you come down? Uh, we got some major issues in the offices. And we went to the sites and when I measured the voltage, we had 170 volts on one of the phases, 270 on another and 340 on another and the only thing that can cause that is the loss of a supply earth and so i knew where the local transformer was and uh, sure enough when i went out to it there's a guy with his jcb and a big pile of copper and all we could do was shut the building down there was no other way around it we had to shut the building down when you lose the supply earth uh, and you get this business of the neutral wandering depending on how much current is being pulled off the different phases uh, we get these increased voltages and that's going to damage electrical equipment it can also cause damage to the cables because the increased voltage um, can cause damage to the insulation so it's a situation that we don't want to occur an earth electrode and connection to earth at the distribution transformer also enables the ground to be used as a type of protecting conductor and we use this in a tt system in the tt system we actually use the ground as a common uh, return path for our earth fault current and we have a source earth electrode and we have an earth electrode at the consumer's end okay and then we're relying on the ground for the return path and the ground was an awful lot of it but it's not a very good um, conductor so we get high impedances and so we end up using rcds for fault protection so all tt systems should have an rcd on the supply so that's source earthing the actual earthing on the source side of the supply when we come to electrical installation earthing or equipment earthing okay we are looking at a slightly different aspect when we consider a system where the supply is connected to earth okay any person that comes into direct contact with a live part so if you take the cover off of a piece of equipment or you stick your finger in onto a live bar okay and you're in contact with the ground you will get an electric shock because you now provide the connection between the ground and that live part and you create a circuit as shown on a diagram now it might be contact between a live part and ground directly or you could be touching a live part and any other piece of metalwork which might be in contact with the ground either way you're going to complete that circuit okay and you're going to get electric shock uh, we used to call this direct contact uh, in the good old days when we spoke plain english um, to prevent this, we have basic protection and safe isolation procedures to stop live work. That's the only way we can stop direct contact. Yeah. Um, you can get additional protection by RCD, but you're still going to get a bit of a wallop off it. Um, because remember, an RCD wasn't, won't trip until it gets to 30 milliamps, and anything over 5, 10 milliamps is going to hurt. But, you know, in essence, the main protective um, equipment there or protective measure there is basic protection insulation barriers enclosures okay and we re we restrict life working to an absolute minimum 
On the other hand, if we have a piece of equipment which develops a fault, such that the live conductor comes into contact with the case, or the live conductor gets damaged, maybe the live conductor becomes loose. Okay, It can touch the casing of the equipment, the casing will liven up, and then we touch that case, that piece of equipment, and we get electric shock because we might be in contact with the ground or any other piece of metal work which is in contact with the ground. Okay, And we call this indirect contact, we used to, it's now known as fault protection. And this could be a piece of equipment, it could be metal containment, it could be a piece of trunking, it could be a piece of conduit, it could be a fuse board, it could be the metal switch plate or a socket plate. Okay. Any of those pieces of conductive equipment which we can touch, which could become live when a fault occurs. What do we do to get over that? Well, we connect a conductor, what we call the circuit protective conductor, to the casing. And we then take that conductor back through the circuit, back to the MET, and we're now providing a circuit for these fault currents to flow. And because it's there and it's permanently connected, we will get automatic disconnection of the supply, ABS. Okay, the moment that fault occurs, that should come into play and we get automatic disconnection. And what we're looking for most of the time is disconnection within 0.4 seconds or 0.2 seconds, depending on whether you've got a TN system or a TT system. This will only happen if the fault current is large enough. Okay, because we need a certain amount of current to operate the circuit breaker or the fuse. If we've got poor installation methods, if we've got poor connections, if we've got cables that are too long, okay, we might not get enough current. So installation earthing is all about providing a low impedance path for fault currents. Yeah, system earthing, the supply earthing stabilizes the system, stabilizes the voltages. Installation earthing is all about providing a low impedance path for earth fault currents to flow. As we know, there's three different systems that are commonly used in the UK. We've got TNS, TNCS, and TT. There are others, but these are the three that are mainly used. And these are the three that we work with probably 99% of the time. So under earth fault, the earthing system will provide this low impedance path. Here we've got a cooker, it's developed a fault, and so the CPC will take the earth fault current back through the system, back through the fuse board, back through the service fuse, and all the way back to the supply transformer, and then return back on the live conductor, all the way back through the system. Once that current flows, instantaneously, we should get operation of the MCB. Remember, the fault current can be calculated. We can calculate it by using the voltage divided by the impedance. Yes, it's part of Ohm's law. To get this operation within the prescribed time, we need sufficient fault current. The lower the impedance, the higher the current will be. So long circuits and poor connections will stop or could stop or slow down the operation of the device. And we have these maximum impedances, which are given in the on-site guide and in guidance note three. These are the adjusted values, okay? Um, and we're fairly well accustomed to these. But sometimes under certain conditions, we cannot achieve these maximum values, in which case we might use an RCD or an RCBO in the circuit to achieve earth fault protection. Remember, we are only talking earth fault protection with RCDs or RCBOs. They do not operate under short circuit. They do not operate under overload. They will only operate under earth fault. So the use of an RCD or an RCBO is not the one, one size fits all solution to protection of uh, conductors and cables in electrical systems. Here we've got a TT system. We can see that we're using the ground as our return path for the earth fault current. That's the standard earth fault loop impedance for a TT system. We're all well accustomed to that. We used to draw these in our sleep. Because there's no earth from the supply and we're using a rod driven into the ground, the 
Resistance path is often fairly poor, could be up to 200 ohms compared to less than an ohm for a TNS or a TNCS. Generally, when you go to the supplier authority, they'll uh, give you a bog standard figure of 0.8 for a TNS and 0.35 for a TNCS. In practice, when you actually do a ZE, you often find they're much, much, much lower. With a TT system, your MCBs and fuses won't operate, so the TT system must have an RCD installed on the supply. Now, in years gone by, this used to be a separate unit, which would be mounted on the, on the wall prior to the actual fuse board. Uh, and nowadays, uh, quite commonly, the actual RCD is in the fuse board itself. And in some cases, you may have a split load board with two RCDs in it, and providing that certain precautions are taken, um, that is acceptable. One issue you've got to think of, though, is that if you've got a metal fuse board, as they are nowadays in domestic installations, and you're coming in with a supply which has got no protection on it, other than the service fuse, uh, you've got to be really careful uh, about the entry to the fuse board, okay, because your RCD protection is beyond that point. So if you have a fault on those cables coming in, or if a cable gets detached or becomes damaged and touches on the metal fuse board, then the fuse board will probably remain live, okay, because the RCD is after that point. Okay. This is why years ago when we used to have the external RCD, that was a, probably a preferable arrangement. Um, but there are certain kits out now, you've, you've seen these, I think Hager to produce them and various other people. Yeah, um, there's a number of different solutions. I mean, the, the tails, yeah. you know, those are double insulations of protective measure. If you can maintain integrity of those tails right up to the actual other enclosure of the RCD, you should be okay. But the problem is if you strip back that outer sheathing, um, yeah. and don't have any other source of enclosure before the RCD, you then don't have that protection there. And it's, it's proper termination, isn't it? Because how many fuse boards do we go to and find that somebody's just taken out a, 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 a knockout, a metal knockout, or drilled a hole in it, and then not bothered to put a grommet in there or any type of gland, and the actual double sheath tails are rubbing against the edge of the hole? Okay, so... Peter, you know, Peter in chat got... says, whisker gland kits for the domestic. Yeah, yeah. That those sort of things, those proprietary kits, which will protect the inter incoming tails, are ideal. Absolutely brilliant. Um, long as you use something to make sure that, that incoming supply is protected and maintained, and the insulation is maintained on the cables, then we can accept the, the split load RCD boards. Remember, though, that if you've got a unprotected um, way on your RCD split load board, then Really, you need to put an RCBO in there rather than an MCB on a TT system. PME systems, TNCS, utilize neutral from the supply in a combined pen conductor. Now, this pen conductor, which is a protective earth neutral, okay, it'll be earthed every 30 meters or so, all the way from the supply transformer up to the end of the distribution circuit. Um, that has fairly sort of interesting connotations um, because we've got these earth electrodes that are spiked every 30 meters or so. Now, depending on where they are, that might affect um, your conditions when you're putting in things like car charging points, electric vehicle charging points, um, you know, and surge protection devices and stuff like that because you've, these things can, if you've got a pen, conduct a spike near your property, then obviously there's a connection there to the earth system, which if you're putting in another electrode on your electric vehicle charging, or if you've got surge protection device, uh, it could have connotations um, when you're looking to yeah. choose it and select the equipment for that. It's interesting. Course, you, you won't know where those are. This no, is it's interesting because obviously in Amendment 1 of the 18th edition, they've added that note to the end of the TN system protection part where it says a TT conversion is probably not suitable due to that proximity of the electro to the PME earthing area. But if you think about when we go to caravan parks where we can then convert it to TT, unless you know the route of that PME cable, you could easily put an electrode in the ground in fairly yeah. close proximity to an underground electrode from a PME. Yeah, yeah. This is the issue. If you're putting an electrode or some connection into the ground and it's anywhere near your 
pen conductor spike, it could cause issues. Um, and this, this, I mean, one thing we used to do was we used to get the old cat and Jenny and work out where the cable was going. If we had a caravan part we were doing, so we'd actually follow the route of the cable, mark that out. So we knew where that was coming in from. Um, and you need to have some sort of method of knowing where those may be with certain types of equipment that we're looking to put in, especially, I mean, surge protection is getting more, um, it's, it's, it's more, you know, it's a big thing for the future. We're putting it in already and it's only going to get more frequent. Car, if electric vehicle charging, that's going to be bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's certain issues here that might um, rear their ugly head, you know, now and in the future. The other thing about PME is, yes, we've got a neutral conductor, which is going, or pen conductor, going all the way back to the supply transformer, but some of the earth fault current will also flu, flow through the soil. So it, it gives us parallel paths, and quite often on a PME system, we can get really, really low um, earth loops, which gives us really, really high earth fault currents. And that uh, can then yeah. be an issue. That I can think... then be an issue. I think that's something a lot of people don't quite understand, especially in the field when they do testing. They chase and look for lower impedances. The lower, the better. Then they don't have to worry about high impedances, but they don't really think about the bigger subject with that. Yeah, I mean, this, this is one of the issues for if you're doing a supply maybe to a, an outbuilding, yeah, where you're using maybe an armoured to feed out to your outbuilding. Because you're on a PME system, you can have really high fault currents, earth fault currents. And sometimes your armoring, if you're using the armorings on earth, yeah, isn't actually up to it. Um, and this is why they would talk about either putting a, an additional conductor in or putting an earth electrode in and maybe even changing the earthing system. That's one of the reasons. I mean, there's, the other issue is bonding. If, it's, um, if you've got services coming in or maybe it's a metal building. But there's a whole range of issues there when we're talking about supplying to an outside building. And there's a lot of reading up and a lot of jenning up to do before you just go and bang an armored cable out to a, a studio or a garage or something. Um, it's not just as simple as it seems. The hazard of a TNCS, the main hazard that we're, we're aware of is obviously a break in the neutral on the supply cable. If we get a break in the neutral, then everything the other side of that neutral break is going to liven up to the full potential. Uh, it's like taking your neutral out of your fuse board. Yeah, you grab hold of the end of it and you know you're gonna get your 230 volt wallop. If you have a break in your supply neutral, everything the other side of it will liven up through the loads of the installation so that your neutral conductor becomes live. And because your neutral conductor is connected to your earth conductor at the service head, and then your earthing system, that means your earthing system will also become live. Okay. If we've got effective bonding, uh, this isn't, you know, we can overcome that issue. However, if you've got certain installations like caravans, uh, marinas, and various other installations, then we cannot permit the installation of a TNCS system. Okay. And this is covered in the regs and certain um, special locations, for instance, that we cannot feed via a TNCS. Used to be the case on building sites. They, they, they actually um, banned the use of TNCS on building sites. And then there was so much of a kick up uh, because so many building sites had TNCS systems coming in uh, that they retracted that and they said, well, okay, you can have a PME system, TNCS, but you must make sure that effective bonding is carried out of all the extraneous conductive metalwork. Yeah, it used to have that ESQCR prohibit, uh, prohibition, didn't it? But then they yeah. kind of appealed it and it came back. But it still strongly recommends it. But the problem with the PME is you have to maintain the integrity of all of those conductors. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, PME is a good system and it is a very popular system. Um, when you consider the from the supply company's point of view, uh, if they're running a PME supply up your street, then they only need uh, a three-core armoured with the the neutral on the um, wave lap around it, you know. So the neutral is a, a copper armoring, which is used as, as your neutral and, and your CPs or your earth. So you'd only need three cores. Whereas if they do it the old fashioned way of TNS, you need four cores and a steel armoring. So it saves money. Um, 
So you can see why it's so popular from the supply point of view. Um, it gives you very good connection, yeah, on your Earth system. Uh, in some cases, too good because you end up with really high fault currents, but that's another issue. Not all systems that have got an Earth electrode, as we know, um, RTT. If you take, for example, a generator, generators used on temporary systems and for backup and stuff like that. Uh, a generator normally has an earth electrode on it, and the earth electrode is for reference. It's to reference it to true earth. If you remove that earth electrode, the generator still has an earth on it. If the generator is floating in midair, it will still have an earth on it, but it won't be true earth. Okay? So the earth uh, electrode on a generator is used for reference. So when we come to testing uh, earth electrodes, if you've got a TT system in a building, fixed building, uh, with RCD protection, you can use an earth loop impedance tester to test your earth electrode. You will get an earth loop because obviously the earth loop is from your electrode back to the supply company's earth electrode and then back through the live conductors. If you're testing a generator earth electrode, you can't use an earth loop impedance tester because there is no loop. You're strictly testing the resistance of the ground. All right. And the Still, when I'm working on temporary systems, I see people sort of standing there scratching their head, trying to test an earth electrode with an earth loop impedance tester. I said, well, look, you, know, you, you don't have an earth loop there. There isn't a return path. It's not going from that electrode to the supply electrode. It's purely there for a reference. Okay, and this is something that, you know. Gradually, we're getting the message over, but um, we still get people sort of standing there scratching their head over it. So, for a fixed building. With a proper TT system, yes, you can use the earth loop impedance tester. Uh, for a generator, where you've just got a one electrode for reference, yeah. no, you, you can't. You've got to do a proper earth electrode test. I think I think people always get confused because the generators will come delivered and there'll be an electrode attached to it. More often, the electrode is just sitting there attached to the generator, but it's just left idle beside it. Um, so they assume it has to be implemented in some way. Um, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it's, it's yeah the the, the the methods of installation differ greatly. Mm. Um, I've seen some companies that drop it from about three foot into soft ground. If it stands up, as far as they're concerned, that's it. It's installed. Uh, we, we've seen them installed like this, haven't they? <laughs> you just yeah, kind of wobble yeah. on the spot. Yeah. Uh, other companies will uh, bang them in until there's only about an inch showing, and then they're a nightmare to get out again. Um, the other thing about earth electrodes, obviously, is that whenever you're putting an earth electrode in, you've got to consider underground services. Uh, you don't want to be banging your earth electrode through another cable, through a gas pipe or a water pipe or a telephone cable. Um, so we always need to consider when we're installing earth electrodes, consider what might be in the ground. Um, and so doing a survey, maybe do, getting a cat and Jenny out and surveying the ground and testing the ground uh, is always a good idea. So while you've got this generator illustration, obviously we refer to generators as like a, a, a TNS system. It's got its own protective. Mm -hmm when would we need to work the generator? Um, always. <laughs> the generator's got its own earth. So when you're putting an earth rod in, you're not putting earth in, you're putting a reference. The reason we tend to put this reference in, and it's, it's highly recommended. Uh, the, thing about, the trouble is BS7909 says it's not necessary, but improves safety. So that's a bit of a funny statement, isn't it? Well, if it improves safety, do it. Okay, uh, GS50, which is the guidance note from the HSE on temporary electrical systems, says do it. Okay, so that's from the HSE. The British Standard 7909 says, well, you know, it improves safety, but it's not absolutely necessary. Um, if you can put an earth electrode in, if you're on soft ground, if you've got the ability to put an earth rod in anywhere uh, in the near location, then do it. Why not? You know, it takes a few it takes a few seconds to put it in. It takes a couple of minutes to test it. So, if at all possible, do it. The one time I haven't put earth electrodes in is when I'm up in the middle of town, especially up in London, where you've got generators on concrete or on tire on paving slabs or marble, as we had in Dubai. Yeah, um, there's no way of putting an earth rod in there. You're not going to start whacking that into concrete. Yeah, so. In those instances, okay, we can ignore the earth rod, but there are other methods of providing a reference. And sometimes you could, you could put an earth onto maybe a metal gate or a metal fence, 
yeah if it goes into the ground or even a lamppost i've seen people doing it to a lamppost remember it's purely for reference it's not carrying a current yeah all it is doing is referencing your generator earth to true earth now the point of that is if you've got a number of generators yeah they could all be at slightly different voltages if they're all floating in midair yeah if they're up on um vehicles or if they're up on trolleys if they're on sort of uh, wooden yeah. sort of standing or whatever so they could be at slightly different voltages because you're relying on the generator connection to give you that earth so by referencing them all to true earth then all your generators will be at the same level mm. so all your voltages will be at the mm. same level and also if you're feeding into a building or you're using a building a fixed building to supply part of your system then the fixed building installation will also be at the same level as your generator system so a lot of generators now they'll have that great uh, great technology built into them with so for synchronizing um yep. we still need to obviously give them all the same reference of an earth don't we yeah synchronizing is all about if you've got a number of generators mm. and they're if you link them together to provide a supply obviously when you start a generator it's a machine okay so you start it up and it once it gets going it starts delivering a, an output an ac output so obviously all your peaks of your phases will be at a certain sequence if you start another generator which is feeding the same system they're connected yeah when you start that generator if you start it at a different time the peaks will be out of sequence unless you're really 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 lucky and if you're that lucky uh, you should be doing the lottery instead yeah um it is impossible you know to tie I mean, you can't do it so this is what synchronization is all about is getting it's l1's peaking here on this generator and it's peaking here on this generator what you want is to get them together so l1 is peaking at the same time on both generators and that's what synchronization is all about getting those frequencies getting the peaks of your ac system your phases perfectly in sequence yeah so just for, using a number just, of different generators just as we're still on generators there's a question oh. is there a specific value of resistance you would require for an earth rod if you were going to test it for a generator it's, yeah. okay yeah well, it's it's the same old it's the same old uh, resistance that you're looking at with um when you're testing earth electrodes for fixed buildings there's no difference there's, there's nothing stated yeah differently in the inspection and testing uh, sequence so when you're testing for uh, an, a, a generator you're basically looking to test the earth resistance okay and you're basically looking for the same sort of values as, as stated in in guidance note three so what you would then do is look at what your rcd protection is maybe on your generator so it's all the same procedure the only key thing exactly, here is the earthing itself is not being used uh, for very full it, it's exactly the same procedure and this is slightly weird because actually you're using it for a different purpose you know and you know i've questioned this a number of times i said well surely all we're looking for is effective connection to the earth yeah uh so is there not a slightly different test uh and basically i've been told no um this use the same test just as you would for standard earth rod on a tt system yeah when using an earth resistance tester so just follow the same guidance in, that's in guidance note three so you're looking at what the rcd protection is on your on your generator so if it's a one amp rcd or if it's a 300 or a 500 or whatever um you would use the same values as from guidance note three there is no different procedure which is slightly weird as i say because you you're using it for a different reason it's for reference it's not actually providing an earth okay okay yeah it's, it's it's always yeah that's always puzzled me slightly that one and thought oh, yeah but effectively we're just proving we've got good connection to the earth so yeah okay I'll, i can accept that right so that's earthing what about bonding bonding what's bonding all about well bonding they look the conductors look exactly the same and they go back to the met um so isn't it the same as earthing well no it's completely different Remember, earthing provides a path for fault currents. Yeah? The nice low impedance path will provide uh, a nice high fault current and ensure that we get ADS within the prescribed time, nice and quickly. Yeah? Bonding does a totally different job. It maintains all the metalwork at the same potential. Now, 
when we're looking at electrical system, we've got lots of metal work, which is part of the system. So we've got things like conduit, we've got trunking, we've got metal switch plates, we've got metal socket plates, we've got metal fuse boards. We've got the metal casing of equipment like uh, fridges and freezers and washing machines and tumble dryers. We've got all that metal work. When we talk about that, that is what we call exposed conductive uh, parts. Yeah, They are exposed. Uh, they, we can touch them. They are conductive. They're metal. They're part of the electrical system, and we call those exposed conductive parts. But we've also got a number of parts, conductive parts, in a building which will actually be connected to part of the earth system because they come out of the ground. And this is things like water pipes and gas pipes and structural steelwork and we call that extraneous conductive parts, okay? They are extra to the electrical system, so they're extraneous. But to be an extraneous conductive part, they need to be in contact with the ground. Ground is zero volts, yeah? So it's part of the electrical system, it's connected to the electrical system. So for a conductive part to be an extraneous conductive part, it must be in contact with the ground. So things like metal window frames are not an extraneous conductive part. Yeah, because there is no connection to the ground. So we don't have to worry about bonding metal window frames. Bonding is all about keeping all this metal work, which is exposed or extraneous, at the same potential. Okay, uh, what we're looking at here is a Faraday cage. And years ago, Mr. Faraday sat in his, his metal cage, which he constructed, uh, and he had his desk in there and his chair, and he had it insulated from the floor and the walls and the ceiling and the, fl and the floor was made of metal and he livened it up to an electrical supply and he sat in there and did his work and he touched all the sides and he didn't get electric shock because everything was at the same potential to get an electric shock you need to be in touch with two different potentials normally 230 volt and zero yeah or in some cases if you're really unlucky two different phases in which case you'll have a 400 volt potential difference. But normally, most electric shocks are uh, single phase to, to ground, to zero or to neutral. Because remember, neutral is connected to ground as well. So bonding conductors will connect all these extraneous conductive parts, your, your water, your gas, yeah, to your main earth terminal. And these services will provide a potential, normally earth potential, because they come out of the ground. Any pipe work or metal work which is connected to it will also have the same potential. So we bond to these. These are what we call main bonding conductors. And that bonds those main services and connects them to the electrical system, the earthing system. So what if we don't do any bonding? So here we've got a, a situation, we've got no bonding here. Um, we've got an earth fault, so the electrical system, all the metal work of the electrical system, the exposed conductive parts, your fuse board cover, your switch plates, your socket plates if they're metal, your casing of your fridge freezer and your washing machine and your tumble dryer, all those bits will liven up to 230 volts because there is an earth fault on your system. All your extraneous conductive parts, your water pipes, your gas pipes, your structural steel work, because we haven't bonded them, will be at zero. Now, the potential for you to touch an exposed conductive part and an extraneous conductive part at the same time is fairly high. Okay, when you consider a normal domestic property, you've got water pipes, gas pipes, you've got the water pipes will feed all around the house, they'll feed onto your radiators, okay. So there's lots of potential there for you to be touching that and part of your electrical system at the same time. And if that happens, you'll get an electric shock because they'll be at two different potentials. If we bond, which is connecting these extraneous conductive parts to the earthing system via the MET, via bonding conductors, nice big juicy bonding conductors, um, when there's no fault, everything's at zero volts. Fantastic. That's what we want. That's how we like it. When there is a fault, what happens is that obviously we've got an earth fault in the system. So the case of the equipment lives up to 230 volts because the CPC is connected to that. 
that lines up to 230 volts, that's connected to the main earth terminal, that lines up to 230 volts, that's connected to the bonding conductors which liven up and they're connected to your gas and your water and your other extraneous conductive parts, so they will also liven up to the full potential. So effectively you could have a situation where your water pipes and your gas pipes liven up to 230 volts and that's slightly weird sort of feeling because um, you suddenly think well hang on is it really safe I've just lined up the whole of my metalwork within my house to 230 volts well it's actually safer because you have a potential bonding zone you've got a Faraday cage yeah and we talk about when if you're out in lightning if you're out in a thunderstorm the safest place to be is in your car because your car is a Faraday cage um, and this is the same what we're creating is a Faraday cage out of your house uh, and all the metal work within it will be at the same potential. If it's all at the same potential, you can't get electric shock. Okay. This obviously is only controllable as long as you're in the house. Once you get outside the house and you're in contact with the ground, out on your lawn, in your garden, then we can't control that anymore because we can't go and bond your lawn. And this is why for years we've had this requirement for RCD protection for socket outlets feeding outdoors. This came in in the 16th edition. It's been in for donkeys. Um, and this has now been extended, obviously, greatly into lots of other, you know, now we have pretty much every circuit with domestic installation now is covered by an RCD almost. Um, so as long as you're inside the building, we can control this environment. Once you go outside the building, we can't. So there are additional risks, additional uh, uh, practices and additional protection that's required normally via an RCD. So this is spooky thing about, yeah, when you bond, all your metal work's gonna liven up. Hopefully, the fault will only exist for a few milliseconds. Yeah, we get rapid disconnection under ADS, uh, but it reduces the risk for that short duration. And there are times when that may be extended. And that could be because your RCD has not been regularly checked. And this is one of the issues we have, especially with domestic properties. Um, we talk about checking of RCDs. Uh, this is now every six months instead of three months, as it used to be. Um, and let's face it, whoever did it every three months anyway. Um, most of the domestic places you go into, uh, they won't have checked their RCD for donkey's years. Um, and this is one of the issues we have, is that unless those RCDs are regularly tested, using the functional tripping button yeah they will probably stick okay if your rcd sticks then it's about as much use as a chocolate teapot it's not going to do anything so if we're relying on rcd protection uh and the rcds are not maintained yeah then we could have a situation where fault conditions will exist for a long period of time and this is where bonding yeah will provide a good degree of protection it sounds a bit spooky having all your metal work at 230 volts, but it's better than having some of it at zero and some of it at 230. Okay, and this is why we need to impress on customers when we're going into installations the importance of testing the RCDs. And if you remember, we had that uh, caravan site again, where we had uh, 110 um, plots, and they all had RCD protection on them, and we took over the inspection and testing of it many years ago. And uh, the first time we tested it out of the 110 RCDs, oh, God, about yeah. over 50 of them failed, um, which was, you know, a little ka moment for us because we had to go around and replace them all. But um, it's not really what you want. Um, so we had to replace over 50 RCDs because they had not been maintained and we couldn't get them working. Uh, so talking, talking about talking a bit slightly off talking about ka -ching, we've just heard that with the um, update to the section for caravans, so obviously looking at SPDs for each caravan charging uh, caravan outlet now as well. Yeah, absolutely. Which yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the SPDs are going to get huge. Well, they're already huge, but they're going to get even bigger. Yeah, we we had to replace over fifty of these RCDs, um, uh, and that was made up purely because they hadn't been maintained. They had not been tested regularly. Um, they stick. Once they're stuck, they're stuck. That's it. Um, now, if you remember the guy, it was down by the river and the guy gave me fishing rights. Um, but uh, so I sort of said to him, I said, all you need to do is 
get one of your maintenance guys just to go around every three months at the time and um, regularly test these things, just trip them, reset them. And when we went back two years later, nine failed. So from a failure rate of nearly, well, about 50%, we were down to a failure rate of less than 10%. And the only difference was they were being regularly tested. So this regular testing does work and it's really important. And we need to impress that on the customer. Uh, as we were talking the other day about um, women took doing the zoning on cables coming down walls and the diagram and the building regs and then the on-site guide. And we said about, well, give that to the customer so they know where your cables are. So this is another thing we should be saying to the customer before we leave make sure you test these RCDs. Yeah. Uh, if they don't, then they might as well not be there because they will eventually fail. And this is really important. Okay, so yeah, by bonding, we'll reduce the risk for this hopefully short duration that the fault exists. What we're looking to do is minimize the touch voltage. Touch voltage is the voltage between two parts. Okay, and we're trying to minimize it to less than 50 volts. 50 volts because anything over 50 volts could potentially cause harm. Um, that's what's recognized as the upper limit of safe voltage, uh, which is why I couldn't understand why it's 70 volts, isn't it, for car chargers? What was the thing you're looking at the other day? Yeah, the 70 volts vehicle. is the limit of voltage exposed to the vehicle and true earth yeah. during the fault. Could couldn't understand why that's 70 volts and we're always talking about 50 volt touch voltage but that's another, the source has put me back discussion. to the source has put me back to the standards um which i've got on the computer where they go you know the hand to the feet but i'm still trying to find the initial point where that was used yeah i just don't understand why we got 50 volts and now 70 volts is why not keep it the same but there you go uh so bonding reduces this resistance and hence the touch voltage between the metal parts now obviously we do the main bond and we normally main bond with 600 mil from the uh, main sort of gas meter on the customer's side. And we quite, well, most of us will bond within 600 mil of the stopcock um, for, for a number of reasons, not least the fact that we know where it is then. And so if you go to an installation, you're looking for where the main bonding has been connected. If everybody does it close to the stopcock, then we know where we're starting from um, rather than trying to search every inch of pipework. Um, because of the resistance of gas pipes, water pipes, and their connections, as well as having the resistance of the cables and the supplementary bonding has been used to reaffirm the connection between the exposed and extraneous conductive parts. So rather than relying on the connections in the water pipes and the gas pipes and the resistance or the uh, conductivity of the copper pipework, we will reaffirm that bonding by using supplementary bonding in various places and this was traditionally installed in bathrooms remember the old cage bonding which was a nightmare um and we quite often see it underneath sinks and baths and in airing cupboards okay this supplementary bonding just the reconnection of one pipe to another to create parallel paths and reduce the resistance well, since the advent of rcds a lot of this is pretty much um redundant you know we, we don't need it anymore uh, RCDs will trip at uh, 30 milliamps. Okay, so we're looking at 1,667 ohms resistance and it will still trip. So um, quite often it's now redundant supplementary bonding. If we do have an increased resistance between any two conductive parts, it could result in a dangerous potential. Okay, so how can we tell when supplementary bonding is required? And remember, not every installation is covered by RCD. There are still a lot of installations out there that do not have RCD protection. Um, talking about um, my daughter's got had a flat up in Edinburgh last year uh, when she was up there at uh, uni. And it was a rented flat. There was four girls living in there. And it was a rewirable fuse board. No RCD protection anywhere. And on the test cert, from, from the landlord, the electrical installation uh, condition report, when I checked it, as you do, as a, a worried father would, um, under supplementary bonding, not applicable. That's what was stated by the test engineer. So no RCD protection, and as far as they're concerned, the supplementary bonding, not applicable. Well, sorry, one or the other has to be in play. Um, so that caused a bit of consternation. I, I sort of kicked off about that. 
um, and I chase the estate agent. Um, so how can we tell if bonding is required? It's not always required, but how can we tell if it is? Well, there's a calculation we can do. Remembering Ohm's law, okay, uh, vehicles I times R. So if we got, for instance, a six amp uh, lighting circuit in a bathroom, perhaps that's the only circuit in the bathroom, just a six amp lighting circuit. Uh, type B MCBs require five times normal rating of current to actually get them to operate. Type B is five times, type C is 10 times, type D is 20 times. So all these are stated in the, um, in the regs book. So a six amp would actually require 30 amps for it to actually trip under fault. So to restrict the touch voltage to 50 volts, the upper limit of safe voltage, we can calculate the resistance between any two bits of exposed or extraneous metalwork. We can use the formula. The resistance is the voltage divided by the current. Zone's law, we just jiggled it around a little bit. So the maximum resistance between any two conductive parts in that bathroom should be 50 volts divided by the 30 amps. So the maximum resistance for any two points in there, 1.67. If we exceed that value, then we need to put in supplementary bonding. So, okay. So what do we test between? Well, we test between the water pipes and maybe the, if it's a metal light fitting, yeah. Uh, we test between the water pipes and maybe the metal screws of the switch. Okay. The water pipes are the bath and the water pipes are the radiator. Okay. So any two bits of conductive uh, metal work, whether they're extraneous or exposed, we will test between them, making sure that the resistance is less than 1.67. If it isn't, then we will need to put in supplementary bonding. I think um, just to add to this, um, when you think about inspection and testing and the fact that we look at tick boxes for inspection, Huh. And we think about supplementary bonding or the requirement. When I, I walk around the site, and people go, do I need bonding here? Do I need bonding there or anything like that? The answer is always 50 volts. That's what I'll say to them. And they'll say, what do you mean? I says, well, if you have a piece of electrical equipment and somebody who uses that electrical equipment when they're using it, you know, when they're using it, if they are at the same time in a readily accessible position to an extraneous conductive part, you know, or an exposed conductive part of a different system, mm. then if they are in arm's reach, then you've got to determine the value of voltage that would occur there in a fault condition. Mm. So if there's an RCD, we assume that's going to get away with it because obviously the 1667 is most likely not to occur. And therefore RCDs normally are a default because of that value. But you still need to verify that. If by the doing RCD... A if the this RCD is, works. This is if the RCD works and if it's maintained. This is always the issue with RCDs is that we are, unfortunately, a lot of people treat them as this safety net. Oh, it covers everything. So we don't need to worry anymore. Well, we do need to worry because they don't always work. They're not perfect. But at the same time, think about how many factories there are that will have equipment and plant and machinery that doesn't have any RCD protection, which will be lots of stainless steel construction, lots yeah. of stainless steel environments, yeah. which will have plant and other machinery and other air, water, and other systems that are mm. electrical integrated into that equipment, there will be some potential between those extraneous conductive parts and the equipment in the building, not just at the origin. And so you need to get your continuity instrument out, measure between the readily accessible exposed conductive part of the equipment that is being used, look, measure to the readily accessible extraneous conductive part that the user can touch, and that value of resistance needs to be obviously lower than the maximum that's calculated by the current of the supply to the equipment that could come under fault. Mm. Um, yeah. That's not covered in any of our 2391 or anything like that. No, well, when, when you consider some of the industrial areas that you go into where they use lots of water for washing down and there's lots of wet processes going on, and when you compare that to perhaps see an agricultural place, you, you know in the special locations there's a picture, a diagram of um, a milking parlour, you know, and effectively, in those sort of situations, you bond everything that doesn't move. Um, if the cow stands still too long, you bond the cow as well. Uh, it's almost I, like that. I remember, uh, I remember working in the old commercial kitchens. We'd see the supplementary bonding. It would then get cut because the trolleys or the equipment or the furniture would be moved around for another event. And it's obviously then not reassessed. 
Yeah. And you end up with these, these little pigtails that don't go anywhere, or these little yeah. cut-off bonds. Well, one of the issues is, of course, is that if you've got a metal stainless steel table, is that an extraneous conductive part if it's not in touch with the ground? And it isn't. Well, no. <laughs> and this is one of the issues, is that sometimes people get extraneous conductive parts mixed up with just metal bits. This comes to, uh, a, this comes to the other issue, which you may have covered in the slide. I know Pete's mentioned it, and I, I mentioned it as part of the content of this, which is obviously where we overbond the crap out of things. Do you yeah. Know? Have we got a slide on that, or do you want to just discuss that? Well, no, it's, um, it's, it's as I mentioned about metal window frames. Obviously, we don't bond metal window frames. They're not in contact with the ground, okay? If something is not in contact with earth potential, then it's not an extraneous conductive part. It does not need bonding, okay? Uh, and there is actually a calculation you can, you can actually do. To, if it goes over a certain value, then I think it's something like 23,000 ohms. If it goes over that, then you can consider it not to be part of the uh, extraneous conductive parts, yeah? So you don't need to bond it. And that's because, you know, there is little or no contact with ground. Um, that's okay, but obviously sometimes these things will change. You know, you, you might put a metal, if you're working in a marquee, for instance, and you put a, a metal um, table in there for doing food preparation, well, that is now in contact with the ground. So you've got to look at every installation on its own merits. And it, so there's no hard and fast rule. You've got to look at everything on its own merits and consider what is an extraneous conductive part and what isn't. If it's got contact with the ground, okay, sufficient contact with the ground, then you've got to treat it as an extraneous conductive part. If it's removed from ground potential, then you don't need to treat it as an extraneous conductive part. It doesn't need to be bonding. Yeah, over bonding is as much of a, a nuisance as, as, as underbonding. So in some cases, sometimes we can actually create more danger by overbonding because we actually end up possibly having a piece that could become live because we've overbonded, we've bonded it, um, which normally wouldn't. So yeah, and in the second part of this, I'm talking about marquees, yeah, and the bonding of marquees, which is a whole subject on its own. And there are instances when you're bonding marquees where it's good to bond and there's some situations when it's probably better not to bond and you've got to take everything on its own merits so there's no easy answer to it all we've got to do is look back to electrical theory our electrical knowledge and electrical science and judge each thing on its own merits yeah um i mean we're, we're now up to about an hour uh or just under an hour um and I'm on slide 26 of 48. So, uh, yeah, we're definitely going to have a part two to this. But we'll just sort of finish off with a couple more slides because um, I want to go through what happens when we have an RCD in a bathroom. Okay, we'll instance. just get to a point where you're happy to conclude and then we'll carry this on. Yeah. Um, so here, here, here's a, a one that the guys can have a go at. This is a 40 amp type B MCB. It's for a shower. Now, obviously, the bigger the MCB, the higher the fault current. So when you're looking at whether you need to bond in a bathroom, rather than checking and testing and doing the calculation for every circuit, go with the biggest one. Yeah. In this case, we've got a 40 amp type B. Yeah. Shower. Um, obviously, if it's 40 amp, it's type B, five times 40. Okay. What current is required to operate the device? Well, five times 40, we're looking at. 200 amps. That's the current required to actually make that MCB trip within the required time. Uh, to restrict the touch voltage to 50 volts, what's the maximum resistance? Okay, we're going to use the resistance equals voltage over current. So it's the maximum touch voltage, which is 50 over the current that's required, 50 over 200. So we're looking at 0.25 ohms. So with a larger circuit, like a shower circuit, yeah, the requirement for continuity between exposed and exposed and exposed and extraneous and extraneous and extraneous is much stricter. Yeah? With the lighting circuit, it was 1.67 because it was only a 6 amp circuit breaker. But because we've got a 40 amp circuit in there, it reduces that allowable value. And this is 0.25 ohms now. So that's why I say to guys, always go by the biggest circuit when you're doing this calculation, rather than doing every circuit. If you've got two or three or four circuits in a bathroom, go by the big one. Yeah. 
And this changes again. I mean, people are probably screaming already saying, well, yeah, but we've got RCD protection. Well, let's have a look at RCD protection. If we change the fuse board, so we've now got RCD protection, it's 30 milliamp. How will this affect the resistance? Well, the operating current is now 30 milliamps. Yeah, 0.03 of an amp. So the equation becomes 50 volts divided by 0.03. We're looking at 1,667 ohms. And this is why most people say if you've got RCD protection in all your circuits in your bathroom, you don't need to bond. Because to have a, a resistance of more than 1,667 ohms in your bathroom between water pipes, you're going to have a very wet bathroom because that's probably an open joint. Yeah. So that's why we talk about RCD protection now pretty much eliminates the requirement for supplementary bonding. But remember, not every installation is covered by RCDs. Some of the older installations are still uh, not RCD protected. So to conclude, and I think we'll just finish here. Yeah, as I say, there's quite a few other slides and, and we're going to, I think we're going to make this a part two because it is a big subject. And if there's anything else you, you guys think you might want to, uh, us to include on this subject of earthing and bonding, please whack it into the chat. Um, earthing provides a low impedance path for fault currents. Okay, keeping the impedance nice and low gives us a nice height fault current. The higher the fault current, the quicker that device will operate. So it ensures automatic disconnection of supply within the disconnection times required. Bonding, completely different. It's chalk and cheese. Bonding maintains all the exposed and extraneous conductive parts at the same potential. Okay, So they do two completely different jobs. Even though they're the same, the same looking conductors and they connect to the same type of equipment, um, they're doing two completely different jobs. So when we think about it, the purpose of earthing is to limit the duration of a touch voltage. The purpose of bonding is to minimize the magnitude of the touch voltage. And that's it in a nutshell, really. Okay. Um, so I'm thinking that's probably, David, a good place to stop if, if the guys are okay with that. As I say, there's lots more to come. Uh, and anything else they want us to throw in there, um, please do whack it on the chat. All right, let me just unmute my microphone. Yeah, I mean, I've been there's been a few, a few questions typed up, which I'm getting to, and it's been very good, um, very good comments. Uh, trying to, wow. Okay. Um, going back to when we talked about electric vehicles, um, yeah. Chris Gardner mentioned suggesting a look. People look at things like open technology, and things like that, because we were talking about you know you know um, putting in electrodes. Yeah, uh, and we did we did mention that briefly on our amendment one webinar about these new technologies, OPEN and um, I've forgotten the others. Also talked about electrical separation for electric vehicle. Yes, yes, um, yeah. Um, somebody then said, um, "Are they talking about getting rid of electrodes for charging points?" The the main the main driver is it's, it's recommended to find another solution than electrodes due to the risk of penetrating a service, and if you're going to obviously go near it you know you can't convert if you convert to a tt then you're going to obviously have that risk of the pme i think coming in the only it does say in the regulation it's in the tn protection regulation bullet point two that you could put in a, an, an electrode onto the tn system but you had to have obviously um that voltage not the reach which i think when you calculate the i did this in the um in the web the previous webinar the formula is in the annex and you have to have about an ohm of electrode resistance to achieve that voltage or lower hmm. so the practicality of that is quite a challenge yeah uh, i think so the, i think the issues of um as you say penetration mm. of services underneath also this business of if you're whacking your electrode in very near to a pen um yeah. earth spike then mm. yeah there's, there's a lot of issues there that need to be really thought about again mm. Um, let me try to resistance level between the two. Uh, and Tony said, with regards to obviously um, reference to the PME supply and installation electrodes, do you think they would they will tell us about some kind of resistance values that should be between those electrodes? I'm not sure. On a PME. Oh, the oh, the earth spikes. The, the, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, we we don't have any access to those anyway, do we? So, um, oh, you know, we eggs. don't know where they are. It's, they're put in by the supply company. It's, it's, and generally, what they do is when they're obviously if they're going up a road, 
uh, up a street and they're supplying houses as they go, mm. what they'll do is they when they make a, a splice a joint in the cable to take a supply, a single phase supply into a house, they will take that opportunity there or we'll put a spike in here and, we, and, and they'll just put a spike in at that point. Mm -hmm. And then 30, 30 meters or so further on, they'll do the same thing again. Uh, yeah. So, so we as installation electricians haven't got the faintest clue where those spikes are. Um, yeah. And it, it is, it's like, it's like searching for the treasure. Uh, you take you, if you put an earth rod in, it's, you're taking pot luck that you uh. might be near it or not near it. As I say, when I'm doing caravan parks, what I'll do is I'll take a cat and Jenny and I'll look for those cables because normally they're a bit nearer to the surface. Uh, but with service cables, it's not always so easy. Mm -hmm. Pete, Pete has been in there from Marina Training offering some good information. He's got some um, information about the date of a broken pen. So apparently 389 broken pens reported in 2018, of which resulted wow. in 41 injuries. Wow. Um, so that's great. Thank you for taking part, Peter. Um, you wouldn't think it'd be that high, would you? Because I know when we talk about this business of a broken pen, and we think, well, yeah, it's, it's a possibility, but oh, it's not going to happen that yeah. often. 389. 389 of them. that's amazing I, I didn't realize it was so so common well, yeah, and, and the, yeah the number of injuries is quite substantial isn't it that's what that's worrying isn't it mm. it's is worrying i've um i don't know if richard 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 emery of asked me a question or made a comment and i have answered i've got the information richard emery, yeah about generators he was um because we talked about you know being known as a tns but he said he did something with the NIC and they said it's not really a TNS or a TNCS, but it's called, un it comes under the term of a TNCS, but a private network connection, a PC, PNC kind of thing. So we'll, we'll do some digging and look up to well, that. Yeah, Much like can, UPS yeah. or PV. Yeah. So uh, all I can say is that all the other guidance I've ever looked at has always said, well, this is actually a TNS. Yeah. I mean, this is, um, this was um, covered by the NIC. So we're going to look into that because it is, um, it's, you know, CPD, it's great because we, we want to know. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, yeah. As I say, the, the whole thing about this is get people engaged, and as as much information as we can get thrown around, the better we like it. Yeah, we look into that and see what they're. Sometimes it's a good idea to look and see what they're saying and get their point yeah. of view, and then we can take an engineering view on it. And sometimes it's 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 the wording or the interpretation. Steph so says. Say, go on. Sorry, Steph says, at one time, he had a high-voltage to low-voltage substation feeder, and there was a standard sock outlet installed in there. And unsurprisingly, it had to be removed due to very high levels of full current. <laughs> <laughs> not, yeah, not tough, yeah. Not surprising. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you consider that on big installations uh, where you've got a short, short cable running from your local transformer into a large installation you can quite often get full currents of 30,000 uh, 30, amps or more. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's not unusual. Um, very, very, very low earth loop impedances and extremely high fault currents, um, which would normally just blow the, 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 the bits out of your uh, protective devices unless you're careful. This is why we use HRC fuses and um, multi case circuit breakers and stuff. Yeah, Peter then added a key point is uh, that people do misunderstand is that pipe work rises in potential due to it being bonded. You mentioned this, that it would be reason to 230 volt potential in the fault. Mm. Many sparks think that bonding is added to remove live potential. So they think it actually, you know, yeah, yeah. It, it, we're, it, we're, we're trying to create that Faraday cage to make us all yeah. at, a, if we're all at a 230 volt potential, then we have no potential difference to then. Yeah, Ask it's, it's, it's a common misconception amongst yeah. amongst guys, yeah. some guys. They don't realise that bonding is actually there to create a rising potential. That yeah. you know, the, the, this spooky sort of scary sort of <laughs> scenario where all our metal work is at all our water pipes yeah. at two hundred and thirty volts. But if it's all good. at the same, you won't actually feel anything. Yeah, that's the point. That's the whole thing. Um, is get it Simon all. says, "What about plastic in comer on the water <laughs> to bond or not to bond?" Oh, that's a that's a subject on its own. Yeah, I mean, there's been talk about the. The guidance now in the 18th edition is if you've got a plastic insert, you don't need to put uh, bonding in because obviously you're no longer connected to earth. Um, now, when I'm delivering courses and when I'm talking about inspection and testing and various other things, my actual guidance to guys is to bond it anyway. Um, and my reasoning is this. Um, I go to a lot of places, um, friends, family, um, and sometimes jobs uh, where people have a, an island in the kitchen mm. okay and they have water or gas 
in the island. Well, how is that water example. or gas? Well, how is that water or gas run? Is it running mid air? Is it floating? Oh no, it's in the ground. Yeah. Yeah. So now that water pipes and gas pipes are now connected to ground again. They're actually picking up a, you know, an earth potential. Mm. So they need bonding. But just because they've got a plastic insert coming in at the mains, they haven't been bonded. Yeah. So now we've got a situation where we've got the metalwork, the other side of that plastic insert is now in contact. It's now an extraneous conductive yeah. part, but, see, but it hasn't been bonded because of the yeah. direction of the 18th edition. But technically, if there was no island, so there was no extraneous conductive parts, and it was an insulated section, the addition of bonding could technically make the installation less safe. Right. Then you take that to the next thing, which is to say, okay, well, your boiler has got a CPC on it. Your pump on your central heating system has got a CPC on it. All your uh, motorized valves on your central heating system. Your so well, when you go to when you go that got far, a CPC on it. When you go that far, we may as well just run, go back to the cage bonding. Well, no. What I'm what I'm saying is that even without this con this connection to ground, yeah, the fact is that most of your so you saying they within should... your installation is going to be connected to earth anyway. So you say um, they should re, re retranslate the definition of extraneous conductive part then? I think I think they need to look at this business of not not providing a, a bond on the insulate. You know, if you've got an insulated section, I don't think it's 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 like with everything else, David. As you know and I know, every installation has got to be looked at on its own merits. You know, and I I had a guy who was doing a block of flats, and he talked to me about it, and I said to him, I said, well, my advice to you would be uh carry on and bond the ground floor flats hmm. but when you get up to the other floors you don't need to bond them yeah because because they've got plastic inserts yeah? yeah they all had plastic inserts but the ground floor i said will bond them anyway just because there's really high possibility of connection to the to the ground of the water pipes or gas pipes but for the upper floors there wouldn't be because obviously they're up in the air Another question: right. How how does how does the calculation? This is the supplementary bonding calculation. Yeah. Change if there's more than one circuit. So let's say you're at one person working, and they've got an extraneous conductive part they can touch, like a radiator, but they're using two items of equipment. Uh, well, they're going to have two potential fault currents. Might, one might be a lot lower than the other. So which one of those currents would equate go to the worst, voltage? As with most worst. things, we go by the worst case scenario. Yeah. So as I showed in the uh, PowerPoint, we had the lighting circuit which only had a six amp MCB. We had the shower circuit, which had a 40 amp. The worst case scenario in that case would be the shower yeah. because it's got the 40 amp. So it's all playing with Ohm's law, isn't it? And, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Remember we, we've got this actually, because um, we're going to do our EICR part two and we've talked about caravan parts and it's going to be some caravan parts in that. Mm. Uh, and one of the slides we've got is a picture of supplementary body that I took on the site where I had a socket outlet and it was just above a metal sink, which obviously had water pipe feeding it. And I measured 0.15 ohms between the R2 of the socket outlet and the sink. And so I calculated the value of, car of a voltage that would be present to determine yeah. if I needed supplementary bonding there. Uh, so we will cover that again later on. Um, some people have asked, you know, we're gonna have to do a part two just to kind of conclude this presentation. Uh, that'll be another free webinar. Um, what we'll do is we'll just make it active again on the site and I'll push a thing, so do look for it. Uh, if anybody's got anything to... particularly they want to yeah I, I, i've got i'm probably just over halfway through on what i'd actually planned i knew this was going to happen because <laughs> we get discussing things and these things take a lot longer so i knew well, this was going to end up as a two-part thing well we could do a little bit of research on this generator thing as well but we could also just do a couple of work examples with the supplementary bonding that does seem to raise a couple of good questions here yep okay. um and also yeah um with regards to the resistance of the body obviously uh, you know, you mentioned the 22 K ohms. Peter's saying it's 230 over 10 milliamp with typical 1,000 ohms. Um, yeah. Somebody else is saying um, they generally say that it's a, 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 your body resistance is a thousand ohms, but obviously if you're yeah. wet, it depends on the condition. Uh, your body resistance is going to be less. Yeah. Um, da da so David again, says. Change. David says 459k test, 21k, 6.6k. The test depends on what milliamp you choose, and I personally use 10 milliamp. The threshold of let go as pipes could be grabbed so i'm a 22k person yeah 
it does seem it does seem that the information is off the reference from different points of view and i guess that because persons are always of different resistances due to the location it's yeah. like when i do when i do when i when i help a company develop a safe system of work and we look at you know saying 50 volts touch volts like, oh, yeah but are you actually working outside or are you in a condition where you're you know confined space with earth or are you in a factory with lots of condensation present these values then suddenly come down lots of variables so a lot lots of it has to be adjusted and we always need to err on the safe side because there's always going to be that one occasion where people are wet and they're not healthy and they're not sort of feeling too good and other situations happen and yeah so we need to err on the safe side okay uh getting to the bottom now yes it will be free um it's all free Right, if there's anything you want a clarification on, if you want us to repeat or to maybe go through again, send an email to the, where well, you've got the webinar email which sent this or just message me on social media and we will help you with any issues and we'll add that to the second half of this earthing and bonding presentation. Uh, that's it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks again. Thank you guys for coming and taking part. Um, I'm just yeah, going to the yeah. bottom. If you have multiple generators, do you need to bond them together or as an individual electrode from each is enough? All right, okay. This is a, yeah, BS7909 says it's a good idea or that you should connect the, um, the earth systems together between your generators. Now, obviously, if your generators are um, sort of a thousand yards apart, Yards. Different environments, they, aren't they? Really? Okay. Well, the thing is, you see, is that your electrical environment from one generator may feed in one direction. Yeah. Yeah. The other generator may, may be a thousand yards away, but it might feed that uh, electrical environment coming back this way. So there could yeah. be some overlap. Well, you, we, now, we talked about this the length yeah. of some of these cables. Yeah. 7909 says that you should connect the um, generator earths together, and it shows a diagram showing a link between the MET of one generator to the MET of another generator. Now, if they're a thousand yards or a thousand meters apart, uh, so I'm getting old, um, this is really difficult to do, isn't it? So, what we're going to look at is it what we're we trying to achieve. What we're trying to achieve is we're trying to link the two earth systems together. Now, if you've got distribution units going out from one generator, using large cables going to a, an ISU or an F, a CDU, which is some distance away from that generator, but closer to a CDU from the other generator, then you can simply link the earth of those distribution units and you are achieving the same thing. You are connecting the earthing systems together, yeah, eliminating resistance and maintaining the potential on the systems. Um, so there's more than one way of, swing, of, of, of sort of swinging a cat here. Um, okay. And that's what I tend to do is I tend to do it by from distribution rather than directly from the generator, because trying to do it from generator to generator in some cases is extremely difficult. Okay. okay. Um, it, it creates more hazard because you've got trip hazards and all sorts of stuff. So do it from distro to distro. I think everybody else has helped each other with the other questions. Uh, okay. Yep, I think we conclude this. Um, thank you guys for taking part. Thank you guys. Yeah, for thanks in. very much. Um, we've got more coming. Um, what's this yeah. afternoon? Introduction seven nine oh nine. Seven nine oh nine introduction. For those, for those who couldn't see the first one. Yeah, for those who missed so, it. Bit of a bit of a uh, oh, another. Well, I guess another relaxing afternoon for me. Hey. Yeah. Cheers, mate. Yeah. yeah you right. take it. You, you take it easy. You take yeah. it easy. I sit here. I sit here doing this. Oh, I'll be answering these questions. Yeah, kick see? back and relax. Yeah. Go on, guys. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your day. If, if we see you later on, we'll see you later on. Um, and I find the end meeting button. Stay uh, safe. Stay healthy. Part two. I'll announce it. Um, I'll schedule it today. I'll schedule it today. Cheers, guys. Bye bye. Bye.